All right, um, so it's great to have you all here. Thank you for joining me. My name is Aditya, you can call me Adi. And today I would like to talk to you about power measurement and attribution in the kernel for embedded system processes. Before we start, here's a brief introduction. I am a graduate student at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and I do research at the intersection of computer architecture, operating systems, and networks. Now, before we start, I would like for everyone to be on the same page so that we have a good understanding. And there's a brief background. So let's take a look at the energy sources for embedded systems. Um, energy sources for embedded systems can include a direct input via DC, or you can have USB powered systems, even Ethernet, right? Another class of devices would be battery powered devices, for example, lithium ion or a CR2032 battery. And a very interesting class of devices would be energy harvesting devices. So these examples serve to illustrate that we can have multiple sources of energy in the system. What is common to all of these classes? What is common is that we want, we want to use the maximum, no, we want to use the minimum amount of energy to do our task. Why is that? Why do we care about using the minimum amount of energy? Because energy capacity, or also known as battery capacity, is a fundamental constraint in the, in the design of any system. For example, microcontrollers or cell phones are constrained by the applications that they can run because of the amount of energy that is needed to accomplish the task. With that in mind, we have come to an understanding that we have a finite resource. How do we manage it? Let's take a look at the problem statement. First, um, to introduce the concept, I would like to bring to your attention a very similar concept of performance optimization. If I ask you to optimize the performance of your program, what would you do? You would say that, OK, I'm going to measure the latency of the application using a mature tool, for example, perf, and I will obtain a metric, for example, seconds or CPU clock cycles. And then I will try to figure out a way to reduce this metric, right? Now, let me ask you the question that is the focus for today. What tool would you use to measure the application's energy? Any ideas? That's a great tool. We will, we will discuss that. Thank you for that. I really like it. Thank you. OK, so before, before we go deeper into this, how have we come to this question? Or how did I come to this question? Well, many, many years ago, in a very faraway land, there was an undergraduate electrical engineering student. And this student was, as engineering students do, studying at the last moment for an exam. The exam's tomorrow, the students panicking today in the library, trying to figure out why the laptop keeps dying every hour, right? And in classic undergrad engineering mindset, this student thinks, hmm, if I kill the applications that are using the most battery, I will be able to study longer, and then I will, I'll be able to pass. So, <laughs> so this student does this. This student tries to do this exactly. He says, OK, I'm going to find out which applications are taking the most battery. And he cannot. He cannot, because this data does not exist. And that is why I'm here talking to you today. So towards the end of this presentation, I would like to, I, I hope that we are one step closer, all of us are one step closer to answering this question. We will not get to the answer, but we'll be one step closer. And that's my hope. Now, let's try to keep thinking how undergrads think. The undergrad said, OK, energy can be calculated using these uh, two simple inputs, power and latency. The power can be obtained from the CPU. For example, the Rappel interface in Intel tells you how much, the power, how much power the CPU is using exactly at that point of time. You can also refer to the data sheet for specific systems. Let's assume that the CPU reports you're using 15 watts of power. The latency, as you saw before, can be measured using a tool such as time or perf. And for the sake of this calculation, let's say that your task takes 5 milliseconds of latency. And great, you know, we have solved it. We have done what we set out to do. Energy is equal to 75 millijoules. Unfortunately, this is not the truth. This is very far away from what is actually going on. Let's try to peel the layers 
and see what is going on here in the system. The first oversight in our calculation model is that this, is, this calculation assumes a linear power draw. I took the value of 15 watts, and I assumed that the CPU is running at 15 watts for the entire 5 milliseconds of time. That is not the case. Here's a slightly realistic CPU power curve. We can see here that we have a lot of valleys and peaks in this curve. And if you happen to measure the power at a valley, you would not even get the full picture. You would run with a much smaller number than what is actually being used. So the first limitation is that power is not constant over time. And there can be a number of reasons for this, right? You can have power gating. You can have different types of instructions. You can have uh, different type of workloads, right? So we need to be very conscious of the power draw at every step, at every, every time in the workload. Second, our calculation model assumes that we can get the number from the CPU. Unfortunately, this is also quite restrictive because we don't consider devices such as EDRAM, our sensors which are polling every five milliseconds, or the network interface, which has an antenna which is constantly burning current. So we have experimental data which demonstrates that these devices can often dominate your entire energy consumption because the CPU peaks, but these devices run all the time. And our data is also corroborated by other research sources um, in a number of research papers and books. So that is the second limitation that we need to break out of the CPU dominant mindset. Third, the interface that we use to get the power value, the data sheet, or REPL, is available only on specific classes of processors. So it might often turn out that you don't even have access to this data in the first place. Sometimes data sheets have conflicting values. I'm sure some of us might have experience with that. And that brings me to the third limitation. We do not have a uniform interface or a reporting mechanism to make sense of this data, right? Now, I would like to summarize all of these problems into this nice crisp summary, which would be we are inaccurately calculating only a fraction of a highly specific system's actual energy consumption. And I think that should be improved. This is a complex statement, right? And I would like to, so I don't want you to focus on the complex. We would like to simplify. I want you to take away this nice summary of this statement. We cannot improve what we cannot measure. So my work strives to measure better. My work strives to improve our measurement infrastructure. How are we going to do this? What is the goal of this project? My, the goal of my work is to develop a framework to accurately and reliably measure the energy consumption of a process on Linux. Right? Now, once we have this, with this infrastructure, what is the use of this? What is the value that we provide to our users? Well, once we have this data, I want to report it to the end users so that our undergrads can study for their exam more nicely, <laughs> so that they can make sense of it in an easy to understand and useful format. We want to expose this data to programmers via command line APIs that improve their actionability. Now, actionability is a loaded word here. We're going to get back to that and see what exactly I mean by actionability. And finally, to system designers. We want to give tools to system designers to enable them to iterate and explore the design space and pick a point in a design space intelligently. Now, this sounds very lofty. Let's try to break this down into exactly what we're going to do. For that, I would like you to focus on this term, framework. In the context of my work, framework means a set of models and tools. What is a model? A power model is essentially how we reason about a device's power consumption. So when we picked that number of 15 watts, in our mind, we had a model that the CPU is burning 15 watts for five milliseconds, right? All of us use models for everything in life. I want to build better models for things that are poorly understood. Some examples can be DRAM or network interfaces. It is hard to reason how a device uses power if I don't understand what is actually going on. Once we have this power model, what we want to do is we want to build tools which can accurately calculate the power based on these models. 
One example of such a tool would be NVIDIA SMI utility that is provided by NVIDIA for its GPUs. The tools come after the models. So in summary, we need accurate models and reliable tools to calculate the energy consumption in a sane manner. With that said and done, let's take a look at how people have tried to solve this problem so far. In the embedded world, a lot of people probe the hardware. What you would do is you would take a set of a tool, like a multimeter or something similar, and you would put the probes on the wire, either on the direct supply or on the specific component. And you would see, okay, for, for this particular duration, the multimeter reports me X value. Now, this is a reasonable way, but it's not scalable, because you cannot always have access to the device. For example, if we consider a large-scale deployment of thousands of devices across a wide geography, and one device malfunctions, I cannot always run to that device, right? So it would be ideal to have a software-based solution that can pull the device and send me the data over the network so I can fix it remotely. Now, how would you do it right now? What is the current state of tool? What is the current state of art? As we saw, we have a tool called PowerTop. And here is an illustration of PowerTop running on a system live. This is a screenshot. This is not live. And I would like for you to focus on two key data points. The leftmost column here stands for power estimate. And the rightmost column tells you what is the process or the device driving that power estimate, OK? I would like for you to focus on one particular data point in this screen. That would be 1.45 watts for GNOME Shell, OK? We're going to see why that matters in just a little time. So it is possible to use PowerTop to view the power estimate of a process, a device, an interrupt, or a timer. However, what did we gloss over here? What did we miss? First of all, power estimate is a discrete time event. Remember, we're trying to calculate energy. And energy is what your battery has. Energy consumption of your application has a higher correlation to your battery life as compared to power at a discrete point of time. So we want energy estimate. Second, PowerTop has vendor-specific implementation. It would be nice to have a general, generalizable tool. And third, remember the two things that I asked you to focus on? Actionability and 1.45 watts from GNOME Shell. Let's take a look at why that matters now. What is the actionability of the data that we just saw? We saw that GNOME Shell takes 1.45 watts. If I ask you to optimize GNOME Shell and reduce this, do you know exactly what you must do? Do you know what steps you need to take? And that's a gap. So we want to provide insights to the programmers that enable them to reduce the energy, right? And that would be really helpful. Now, we saw our problem statement. We saw our goal to calculate energy reliably. And we also saw the challenges with the state of the art. Let's try to take a look at the system design that I would like to build, or that I'm working on. On the screen right now, you can see a simple flow chart of, it's a very high level uh, system design for what, what, we're, what we're building. The leftmost blue boxes represent the inputs. The brown box represents a regression model. And the green box is the output, which is what we're driving for. Essentially, this is a regression model. And regression comprises two inputs. You have the regression parameters. And you have the inputs to the regression. How are we going to get these parameters and these inputs? Let's take a look at the parameters. To get the parameters for the regression model, we have an algorithm. What we do is, first of all, we take the system at the baseline state. Okay? We stabilize the system and turn off everything as much as we can to determine the idle power. This is very important, because 
uh, this is the power data system is going to burn anyways. Okay. Once you have reliable reading for the idle power, what you would do is you would turn on one device. Let's take the example of the backlight, the screen. You turn on one device and you would observe a fluctuation on the value. And that fluctuation is what, of course, I'm, I'm talking about a stabilized value. I'm not talking about the transient. That fluctuation is what matters to us because that fluctuation is what the screen is costing me at all times. Once we have the baseline for the screen, what we would also do is we would sweep because I understand that the screen at full brightness takes more power than a screen at low brightness, right? In my mind, that mental model always needs to work. And we sweep this value from low to high to understand how much the fluctuation varies. And all of this gives you data points. At idle rate, at low brightness, at high brightness. And what you do is you repeatedly correct, collect this data for different devices. All the target devices in your system, ideally, you want to turn them on, off, and sweep them. And this data can al uh, allow you to solve for the regression parameters. This gives you the regression models in uh, parameters. That would be the A in the AX equal to Y. OK, so we saw how we get the one-time measurements. And that gives us the parameters. Let's take a look at the third blue box on the center, the process accounting infrastructure. That gives you the input variables. So our goal is to determine the inputs to the regression model. And for this, the algorithm goes like this. The first step is that we identify the PID and the group processes. We have a workload. That workload has an identifier, and the PID is used to identify it. We pull the process accounting infrastructure, or as it is known as uh, popularly slash proc, for this PID. The process accounting infrastructure at all times logs the resources that are being used for this particular process. That would include the jiffies, or the time, the network connections, or the sockets, the file handles, or the disk usage, the memory set size, that would be the DRAM usage, and we obtain this data. One very interesting data point here is screen wakeups. It turns out that if you frequently cycle through screen wakeups, you're going to tank your battery. That's not good. Don't do that. OK, so finally, let's say that you have this data over the entire time, right? Let's say that you do the measurements for 10 seconds, but your process was not running for 10 seconds. We live in a multiprocessing world. And in a multiprocessing world, your process runs for some amount of time before it's being before it is preempted. So we need to calculate the fraction that must be attributed to that process. Let's say that your process ran for 1.5 seconds over this 10 second period. So the fraction here would be 15%. So I can attribute only 15% of the system's power use to this particular PID, right? And this data gives us the input to the regression model. Once again, we summarize. We have the device specific measurements for the parameters. We have the inputs via the PROC interface, and that gives us the data that we need to predict an energy value. Now, are we done yet? I, I still have a little bit of time, so we're not done. <laughs> we're not done, OK? What we just saw is a system design. I want to discuss with you the challenges and things that I would appreciate your feedback on, things that you can ask me questions on. First of all, this system predicts an energy value. So at the end of the day, it is an estimated value. It's not exact ground truth, OK? And I would like to add this line. I, I like it. It's very popular in the machine learning community. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And my hope is to build a useful model, OK? Second challenge, there's a bias and accuracy trade-off. Now, if you think a bit carefully, what you're doing is you're running a process on the system, that's your target workload, and you're adding additional load. Your, your, your measurement infrastructure is also doing some work on the system now. So you have less resources available to do your original task. And if you have a very complex model, which is super accurate, 
which takes in a huge amount of parameters. That's going to create a huge amount of load. So essentially, the readings that you get from that super accurate model would be biased. So we have a Pareto frontier here between accuracy, which would be a model with a large number of parameters, and bias. And what we want to do is we want to sweep this, per this frontier to identify a sweet spot between the accuracy and bias that the system can get us. Another challenge, data collection. The Linux ecosystem is extremely diverse, especially when it comes to embedded platforms. There are millions of devices, thousands of vendors, billions of ICs. Um, very often, even data sheets are not available for some of these devices. And the power estimates can range across two to three orders of magnitude. As an example, you can have an edge device which runs within a budget of few mi uh, milliwatts. And you can have a server class data center, uh, a server class data center device which would easily pull in a thousand watts. So we see a huge difference between the range of the value. An error of one watt for a server would not matter much. But for a milliwatt edge device, one watt is going to fry it. Right? So we need to be very careful with the accuracy that this model gives in the context that it is running. Being mindful of the context is critical here. And continuing on the same line of thought, there is a significant difference between the estimated value and the actual value. There is always a ground truth. How do we identify divergence from the ground truth? I cannot always probe it. Right? We established that it's not always possible to probe it manually. If I cannot obtain the ground truth, is there a way for me to identify a diversion from it in another way? I would love to know about this. This is something that is super important. Like, we need to be sure that the value that we are seeing is useful, relevant, reliable. And privacy. Um, this one is a bit more, um, let's say, philosophical, but I would love to get inputs. Who should share this data? Um, if you're not familiar, there is a significant amount of research which demonstrates that I can identify what exactly you're doing on your device by looking at your energy and power patterns. I can identify you're running Firefox and a particular website on Firefox by looking at the instruction trace and the power patterns. So how do we collect this data? Because we do need the models. We do need the models to get the energy values. So what is a reasonable privacy conscious way for people to share this data? And once we have this data, who owns it? Who manages it? Who profits from it? Who organizes it? Very difficult questions. Great, so a few challenges that I'm struggling with. Let's get back to the good stuff. Um, we see a lot of talk about carbon emissions. We see a lot of talk about how do we power these LLM models and how do we constrain the carbon emissions coming from these LLM models. Let me ask you this. How do we calculate the carbon emission of an embedded platform? And I'm talking about operational carbon emission for the folks who are in this business. So here's one way. To calculate the carbon footprint, what we would do is we would take the energy consumption, and we would multiply it by this, this interesting term called energy composition. We just saw how do we get to the energy consumption. What about the composition term? The energy composition refers to how the energy that you're using to power your device was produced. Okay. It depends on a number of factors, which include where the energy came from, how it is stored, what was the geography of your operation, what is the time of use. Um, if you have a device operating in daytime, from daytime power, it might be powered from solar. And also grid load. So this is a complex electrical engineering problem. But fortunately, we have a lot of good people working on this. There are libraries which can tell you the energy composition, assuming that you can provide them the, their inputs. So I would like to constrain myself on the consumption problem. My project focuses on consumption, and I trust great people will solve 
composition. So let's get to the goods. What is the product? This is the product for our undergrads. I want our end users to have useful data that enables them to do something in their real life. We can see here that we are able to report data for our device or a particular application. I believe this would be very helpful, not just for undergrads, for everyone, OK? For the programmers, what, what is the end goal is to have a command line API that indicates what is the energy value for a process. And one really nice, really cool use case would be that, let's say that you're programming in your favorite IDE, and you write a triple nested for loop. And immediately your IDE says, oh man, this is going to take a lot of energy, you know? Maybe consider rewriting it. I think that would be fantastic. It's, it's, it's an ideal end goal, but I'm working towards it. So I want to have energy efficient code optimization suggestions live in the platform to improve programmer actionability. And for our system designers, we want to help them iterate in the design space. The design space comprises performance, energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, cost. People typically have a good view of cost. You also are able to iterate over performance. And I want to open up this axis of energy efficiency, which can also help with the carbon efficiency. So we want to enable device, we want to enable system designers to pick devices or to iterate over devices with different energy consumption values based on the power budget that they have and explore the design space better than how they can do it today. So um, that is the product. And that brings me to the conclusion of this talk. First of all, I really appreciate you showing up. I understand that this was a bit too much. And I would like to summarize this talk into two key distilled takeaways. Like, forget everything else. If, if you, don't forget, but if you forget everything else, I would be very happy if you remember these two things that I helped you get closer to today. First, we cannot improve what we cannot measure. And this applies to many things in life, not just energy. And second, we need to break out of this CPU dominant mindset, right? Like the CPU centric mindset in life that CPU is everything and that's all we need to focus on. Because we have devices that are drawing enormous amounts of energy. Do not quote me on this, but in data center design, memory has already eclipsed CPU as the dominant energy consumer. Do not quote me on this. So I hope we are one step closer to answering the question that we started with, a tool that we can use to measure the energy of a particular process. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate your attention and open the floor for questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, since I have the mic, I'll ask the first question, if you don't mind. Uh, so at Texas Instruments also, we have been facing this challenge where you did talk about systems uh, in the context of a PC or a laptop where the peripherals are outside. But today, in the complicated ARM SOCs that we have, even inside the SOC, there are many peripherals or many controllers whose power we need to measure. So TI sort of came up with this uh, power estimation tool. So we ship out this Excel sheet where we have an estimate of how much power each uh, peripheral would consume, for example, a GPU or a SPI controller, and at what capacity, what clock rate, et cetera. And then you can feed in those values and then get an estimate of how much power your system would consume theoretically. So I think it's a very interesting challenge that you have posed here. And to go at the process level and uh, try to sort of uh, measure that, it's going to be a challenging problem. Uh, the thing that you said uh, about applying the model across embedded systems and server grade, I was wondering, do we really have to do that? Why can't we have different models depending on each system? So just to repeat the question for the audience, um, first of all, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate the kind words. 
To repeat the question for the audience, um, our audience member asks if we have to use the same model across different contexts. That's a great question. I believe we do not need to use the same model across different contexts. However, this brings the challenge that you need to get more data. So the ability to pick a different model depends on the data availability for that context. And data is not easy to come by in this world. But thank you for the question. Um, I, I support this. I'm with you on this, that we need different models for different contexts. Yes. Thank you for the talk. I think it's a really uh, nice idea. Uh, I was going to ask, it, because in practice, it seems like, of course, if you have a vendor like TI who is supplying these sorts of power estimates, um, your job at creating this model becomes a lot simpler. Um, in the case that, for instance, you have some hardware accelerator, and um, perhaps you don't have either um, you know, information from the vendor on what power it's expected to consume. Um, you know, maybe you can measure it yourself. The other thing that you may not have from the vendor is statistics on utilization of the device. So for instance, I thought you know, your measurement of network traffic is a good example of where it might be easy to do this modeling because, for instance, the number of transmitted bytes might be you know, closely correlated to how much transmit power is consumed by the Wi-Fi card. Um, but like, have you considered some of these, for instance, neural net accelerators where the accelerator may be doing some processing and it's a very opaque black box in terms of you know, how this accelerator is actually utilized. Um, and, you know, Linux, you know, whatever drivers are available in some cases don't report, you know, much detail about, you know, what the actual utilization of the transistors in this processor is. Um, so, like, have you come across those sorts of situations yet um, where it becomes hard to get that utilization data? So that's a great question. I would like to repeat the question for the audience. The question is that, assuming that we have a black box device which does not report statistics about use, how do I attribute the energy in that case? That's a great question. Um, if you remember, we discussed this algorithm of the baseline. Now, even if it's a black box, what black box means is that I lack the mental model of what is exactly going on. But I can still observe the effects of this device. I can still measure my baseline, give this device a workload, and then observe the fluctuation. And that allows me to build a rudimentary estimate of how the device will likely work. Does, uh, that, does that answer? If I may give an example again yes. in the context of a TI SOC. Uh, so we have Linux running on the A53 Cortex-A cores. And, uh, but at the same time, we have MCU M4, MCU R5 cores coexisting at the same time. So although Linux has a driver called as remote proc that can help us load the firmwares, there are other scenarios where Linux may be completely unaware of firmwares running on uh, MCUs that are running on the same SOC. So in that case, I don't think Linux will have any knowledge uh, of how much power and how power is being consumed by the other yeah. peripherals. So um, I understand. I would like to bring to your attention something that is common to all of these systems. I'm assuming that these systems are being powered by a battery. That is my assumption. And Often, very often, if you have a single battery-powered source, the battery always reports to you the amount of energy left in the reservoir. You can still obtain a difference in the battery level by turning that device on and off. And that gives you another way to get a rudimentary estimate. It would not be perfect but it will be one step closer to the end goal. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, uh, there is one solution that uh, we sort of offer in our EVMs. 
uh, we actually have current sensors or INAs to various rails like DDR, uh, SOC core, etc. So you can actually probe these current sensors uh, within the SOC itself. So even Linux can have access to how much current exactly the system is drawing. So maybe that can help you in this research as well. That would be very, very nice. I will take a look at that. Um, maybe we can connect and you can point me to the resource. Uh, definitely, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Great questions. So regarding the problem of divergence, um, does this model expect the power profile, like the power usage behavior of a device to be consistent over the lifetime of the hardware and the device? So um, to repeat the question for the audience, our audience member asks that over the lifetime of a device, we expect the power values to shift. That is correct. And I do not know how to answer that. <laughs> um, I want to, but I don't know. I'm not confident that I understand what you mean by divergence specifically. Uh, but a lot of systems have temperature sensors, if not power sensors. And I am wondering if, uh, if you can use some measurement data to say, like, look, where our, the system is very hot but our measurement is consistent with like a lower temperature in the past. Is this like a source of uh, drift yeah. or, or very cold when it's reading too high or something? Like the waste heat is a signal of energy use. So to repeat, um, we can correlate the temperature with the readings mm -hmm. and try to get more sense. That should be possible. I believe that is one approach, but I have not looked into it. Okay. But Thank you for the input. It's yeah. really helpful. Yeah, actually, uh, again, we have actually seen a difference in how much power a device consumes just uh, with the delta of 4 degrees Celsius. So if you operate at 26 degrees C versus 30 degrees C, you will see a difference in the currents being consumed by the device. So it is a very important and sensitive thing to factor in temperature. Oh, the temperature also impacts the power draw? Oh, it does, yes. Feedback loop. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Great point. Thank you. I really appreciate it. How do you attribute power usage of shared uh, peripherals like the screen or the backlight to individual processes? So to repeat the question, the question is, a screen is a unified resource for different applications. And how can we attribute a single resource's power to different processes? At this point, I do not do that. I attribute the power of the screen to each process. However, if we build this model further, it is possible to identify the fraction of the frame buffer that is being used for each process. I believe it should be possible. I think the Wayland subsystem, I'm not sure, but I believe the Wayland subsystem might expose this. And that might allow it, but again, we have background and foreground problems as well. So I, I do not know how to attribute that. But I would like to very much in the future. Thank you for the question. Actually, I'm wondering if the approach with these models where you then want to, I don't know, account uh, the power measure, uh, the, the amount of power that is used to particular events or devices is the right approach at all. Or if we just say we observe and then we identify patterns which are good or bad, and with these patterns over time, we try to find out by our, I don't know, like machine learning models can do that, which, F, which devices or which sub patterns have the biggest influence on either making, uh, requiring more power or requiring less power. So I will, I will repeat the question to clarify because I did not fully understand the question. Uh, what I understand is that you are indicating we could 
look for patterns in power consumption instead of exact measurements. Exactly, yes. And even to get a pattern, even to get a pattern of energy, we first need to measure energy, right? Yes, but we don't need to account that. We, we just take in all the measurements or all the sensors we have, like temperature, power sensors, also CPU utilization, amount of writes to disk, all this kind of data we have. And based on that data, we do pattern recognition. So if I understand correctly, you would like to have a mechanism which does not calculate the energy, but instead tracks the symptoms to indicate a problem. Exactly, yes. That could be quite useful. However, it does not allow one, a few of the key objectives that this project tries to achieve and that would be measuring and optimizing the energy for a particular budget. And also, for the system designers to iterate over the design space, it can tell them where not to go, but it cannot help them pick a good point. But it is a good idea. It is a more feasible idea. I agree. Thank you for the question. More questions, please. Well, I'm going to run away after this. This is your last chance. OK. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to present my work. I appreciate your audience.